Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question asks if I can analyze the mental health and personality factors that may be at work in the Mary Kay Letourneau case. Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoyed this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I'll put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. So here I'll be looking at Mary Kay Letourneau's background, the timeline of the crimes, then I'll move to the mental health and personality factors. So starting with the background, Mary Kay Letourneau was born on January 30, 1962, in Tustin, California. Her father was an instructor at a community college. He would later be a politician. Her mother had worked as a chemist in the past. Her father had an affair with one of his college students, eventually having two children with her, which effectively ended his political career. This affair also led to the separation of Letourneau's parents. They would get back together later on, though. Mary met Steve Letourneau when she was attending Arizona State University. He was a student there as well. After the two were married, he became a baggage handler and worked in Anchorage, Alaska, but eventually was transferred to Seattle, Washington. Letourneau would go to school in Seattle and earn a bachelor's degree in 1989. She started teaching at an elementary school just outside of Seattle. The Letourneaus had four children. In 1999, when Letourneau was incarcerated, the couple would get divorced and Steve would win custody of all four of those children. Some have reported that the Letourneaus had a dysfunctional marriage, both of them had affairs, and it's been alleged by Letourneau that she was abused by Steve Letourneau. Now moving to the timeline of the crimes. There was a student at the school where Letourneau taught named Vili Fulau. Letourneau taught him when he was in the second grade and again when he was in the sixth grade. He was born on June 26, 1983, which means he was almost 13, and Letourneau was 34, when the two would have an encounter with the police on June 18, 1996. On this date, at night, we see in a marina parking lot, the police approach Letourneau's minivan. It contains Letourneau and Fulau. The police noticed that Letourneau quickly moved into the front seat, and Fulau stayed in the back seat pretending to sleep. When questioned, both of them gave the police false names. Letourneau also indicated that Fulau was 18 years of age. Letourneau made up the story saying that Fulau was a family friend who was staying with her and her husband. She said an argument broke out between her and her husband and Fulau was there. Fulau became upset by what he witnessed and he fled. Letourneau left the house in search of him and they ended up in this marina parking lot. The police took them to the police station and called Fulau's mother. Evidently, they did not make the mother aware that Letourneau had misrepresented Fulau's age, and they also didn't tell the mother what they believed happened in that vehicle. Without this information, Fulau's mother told the police to let Fulau go with Letourneau. So no arrest was made here, but Letourneau would become pregnant two months later with Fulau's child. One of Steve's relatives called the police on her, and she was arrested. Letourneau would plead guilty to two felonies. She was sentenced to 89 months in prison. It was reduced to 80 days in jail and three years of sex offender treatment. She was not required to register as a sex offender. In May 1997, prior to sentencing, she gave birth to Falau's daughter. Under her plea agreement, she could not have contact with any minors, including her children and Falau. Letourneau would be released from jail on January 2, 1998. On February 3, 1998, at 2.24 a.m., Seattle police were looking for a stolen car when they noticed a gray Volkswagen Fox with steamed windows. In it, they found Letourneau and Falau. They also found Letourneau's passport, baby clothes, and $6,200 in cash, causing them to be somewhat suspicious about her intentions. She had violated the terms of her plea agreement by being with Fulau, so a judge reinstated her seven and a half year sentence. Now this was just for violating the no contact order. The police could not determine if the two had sex in February, although later we would see that Letourneau admitted that they did have sex in January. I think one of the reasons she may have admitted this is because she gave birth to another daughter in October 1998. Fulau was the father. So it really wouldn't take Sherlock Holmes in this case to connect the dots. Letourneau was released from jail on August 4, 2004. She registered as a level two sex offender. 
Laterno and Fulau would get married on May 20, 2005. Fulau was 21 at this time. He was able to convince a judge to reverse the no contact order. Laterno was diagnosed with colorectal cancer and would die on July 6, 2020. She was 58 years old. It's been reported that Fulau was by her side for the last two months of her life, even though the two were already legally separated. Now moving to the mental health and personality factors. The issue of mental health was briefly touched upon in the court proceedings. Experts claim that Letourneau had bipolar disorder, and this explained her criminal behavior. Now this is something that's very common in these types of cases, pulling out a diagnosis that explains all the bad behavior, and yet not really showing how the disorder caused significant problems prior to the criminal behavior. By most accounts, before Letourneau offended, she was highly functional. She was a school teacher, a mother of four, a productive citizen, and now all of a sudden she has mental health symptoms that are so severe she commits multiple felonies. Another problem with this bipolar theory is that Letourneau held on to this fantasy for seven years when she was in prison. So this wasn't just about one or two mistakes, one or two lapses in judgment. She was in prison for a substantial amount of time and still came out wanting this relationship. So she may have had bipolar disorder, there's no way to know, but it doesn't really seem to explain this criminal behavior. Outside of bipolar disorder, when she was young, she was watching her three-year-old brother and he drowned in a pool. So there may have been some effect from trauma. Another theory here is that Letourneau's behavior may align with a few cluster B personality features. So we can look at a few here. We see indications of narcissism, a sense of entitlement, the investment fantasy, believing oneself to be special. We see indications from borderline, like impulsiveness, antisocial characteristics like repeat offending, and histrionic characteristics like being sexually provocative. Now, looking at a conceptualization of her personality using the five-factor model, I remember the five factors through the acronym OCEAN, openness to experience, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. Letourneau appears to have high openness to experience. She was creative. She appreciated art. Now, what's interesting here is that intellectual curiosity is one of the facets of openness to experience, and it's positively correlated with intelligence. But I'm not convinced that Letourneau was intelligent. So we may see an exception here with this facet. It could also be that she was low on intellectual curiosity, but still high on other facets. Letourneau appears to have low conscientiousness. Again, we see impulsivity, but also it's been reported she was late for everything. Now, with extroversion, I think she's mid-range. We don't really see anything that stands out here. With agreeableness, mid to high, she was somewhat trusting and altruistic, but of course she was also willing to be disagreeable, but I wouldn't say low agreeableness. With neuroticism, we see a high level here. We see difficulty resisting temptation. So with this in mind, what was really happening in this case? What was the motivation for Letourneau to offend and then after serving time in jail, reoffend. There are two different theories about the nature of Letourneau as it relates to this case. There are many people who are invested in each theory. One theory is that Letourneau is a criminal. She caused harm to a child. She's a sex offender, plain and simple, right? So this is just somebody who got caught. They became fixated on a victim and they would not let go. A second theory is that Letourneau's thinking was so distorted, she believed the two were star-crossed lovers. Under this theory, of course, she is still a criminal, but she has been misunderstood by a cruel and uncaring society that refuses to understand how these two are different than other couples. They couldn't see the relationship as being special and wonderful. I think it's interesting that both theories actually point to the idea that her behavior was narcissistic. So let's explore these two theories by breaking down some of the various statements and reports we see about this case. I'll start by looking at the items that support the first theory. Again, Letourneau is simply a criminal who understood her actions. Letourneau said that she knew what she did was wrong, but it never crossed her mind that having sex with Fulau was a crime. She said that no one ever told her there was a specific law about that. Now, this is a pretty high standard in terms of finding out what's illegal or what's not. In order for her to obey a law, somebody has to come up and tell her about something being illegal. Well, there are thousands of laws. So did she expect somebody to come up and tell her about every possible law? If nobody ever told her treason was illegal, 
Would she have went and committed treason? So really, this is an impossibly high standard. She's just saying this to deceive people. She said that she felt the tragedy that the families went through because of this relationship, making it seem like she didn't cause the tragedy. So she was talking about it as if it was something else remote, distant from her, and she just didn't know what was happening. It was just something bad that had to happen. She had no control over it. She gave the judge her word that she would not offend again. Later, we find out that it was her plan to be with Fulau the whole time along. So again, we see deception. She was not deterred by the prospect of prison. She wasn't happy about going to prison, but again, she was still focused on that relationship. She believed that the criminal justice system had deceived her. She said that they told her if she pled guilty, she would be able to be with her children, but then they didn't let her, so she was cheated. So in all this, somehow Laterno was actually the victim. Now, when she was discussing the early days of her relationship with Fulau, she talked about how he became very assertive, as she put it, in pronouncing his love for her. So again, we see this disconnect, like she didn't understand that she was the adult. She talked about how she thought they were just going to kiss, and then somehow it ended up being more. And she was confused by this. So no ownership at all about her behavior. In one of her interviews with Barbara Walters, Letourneau said that she was going to go to court and have her sex offender status removed. As far as I know, of course, that never happened. She condemned other teachers who did the same thing, saying that they didn't learn from her example. So again, her standard is that somebody comes up to her and says, hey, this is illegal. And yet she expects every school teacher in the world to have learned about her story. So again, we see a failed attempt to be logical. She just can't put the pieces together. She holds herself to one standard and everyone else to another standard. Her overall sentiment in terms of remorse is really this. She has no regrets except getting caught, right? So this is a real antisocial and again, narcissistic type of perspective. Now looking at the items that may support this second theory, Laterno is a criminal with distorted thinking she didn't understand what she was doing. Letourneau stated that her relationship with Fulau was eternal and endless, as opposed to those pesky, time-limited eternities. She said that nothing would keep the two apart. So again, we get this idea that Letourneau believed in destiny. Letourneau has successfully convinced many people that the story of her and her victim is actually a love story, including her attorney. She has stayed remarkably consistent with this particular narrative. When Letourneau describes the early days of her relationship with Fulau, it's almost like she never really fully understood that he was a child. She talked about how she was excited to hear that Fulau loved her because she was having feelings too. Almost like she was giddy, like she was a teenager. Letourneau rationalized the age difference between the two, saying that her grandmother had made it to 100. So she expected the same thing. Now, of course, we know that Letourneau was 42 years short of that goal, but technically there was about a 5% chance that she could live to 100, other than the fact that Letourneau was bad at math, which is surprising considering she actually taught math. I think that what this statement really indicates is that she believed that she would have a long and happy life with Fulau. There was a heavy investment here in fantasy. Not only did she not live to 100, but the romantic relationship with Fulau ended three years before her death. So putting this all together, what do I think happened in this situation? I think that Letourneau's behavior aligns with being extremely impulsive, so reacting to emotions. We see a lot of immaturity. This is actually something we see repeatedly. At the same time, her behavior aligns with a high degree of narcissism, specifically in the area of fantasy. She had a fantasy of the ideal love. She was able to invest in this so much, she lost touch with reality. There is another indication of this when she talks about her relationship with her children and how she coped with not seeing them when she was in prison. She said that she would not let herself touch on that pain. So she was able to keep reality at arm's length. Laterno became irrationally fixated on one person and the outrage that we saw toward her only reinforced her false belief that she was doing the right thing. So this is different than being resistant to criticism. She actually interpreted criticism as something that supported her point of view. This is a lot like what we see with conspiracy theorists. When people tell them 
that the conspiracy is not supported by evidence, they use the fact that a person told them that at all as evidence the conspiracy is true. So it's a failure to logically process information. I think she was a criminal who understood that what she was doing was criminal. But her fantasy deserved more. Her fantasy meant that she was above the law. So she chose to break the law in order to fulfill her dreams. So in her mind, she really deserved this, right? Society did not understand how special she was or how special her relationship with Fulao was. So in a sense, both theories have elements of truth, but I mostly go with the first theory. Her distortions did not prevent her from understanding that what she did was wrong, but she came up with her own definition of wrong. So she knew other people believed it was wrong, but she also believed she knew better. Her values superseded the values of society. So we see kind of a dangerous level of narcissism where she was able to take something that was wrong and make it right, causing harm the whole time along. So those are my thoughts on Mary Kay Letourneau. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be interesting. Thanks for watching.